You must forget my earthly name and speak to me as Charmian. This is indeed no dream. Dreams are with us no more, but of these mysteries, Anon. I rejoice to see you looking like life and rational. The film of the shadow has already passed from your eyes. Be of heart and fear nothing. Your allotted days of stupor have expired, and, tomorrow, I will myself induct you into the full joys and wonders of your novel existence. True, I feel no stupor, none at all. The wild sickness and the terrible darkness have left me, and I hear no longer that mad, rushing, horrible sound, like the voice of many waters. Yet my senses are bewildered with the keenness of their perception of the new. A few days will remove all this, but I fully understand you, and feel for you. It is now ten earthly years since I underwent what you undergo, yet the remembrance of it hangs by me still. You have now suffered all of pain. Tomorrow we will speak of this. Your mind wavers, and its agitation will find relief in the exercise of simple memories. Oh, God pity me I am overburdened with the majesty of all things of the unknown, now known. Of the speculative future merged in the certain present. Most fearfully, this is indeed no dream. Was I much mourned in death? Mourned, mourned deeply. deeply. To that last hour of all. There hung a cloud of intense gloom and devout sorrow over your household. The individual calamity was, as you say, entirely unanticipated, but analogous misfortunes had been long a subject of discussion with astronomers. I need scarce tell you, my friend, that, even when you left us, men had agreed to understand those passages in the most holy writings which speak of the final destruction of all things by fire, as having reference to the orb of the earth alone. But in regard to the immediate agency of the ruin, speculation had been at fault from that epoch in astronomical knowledge, in which the comets were divested of the terrors of flame. The very moderate density of these bodies had been well established. They had been observed to pass among the satellites of Jupiter, without bringing about any sensible alteration, either in the masses, or in the orbits of these secondary planets. We had long regarded the wanderers as vapory creations of inconceivable tenuity, and as altogether incapable of doing injury to our substantial globe, even in the event of contact. The contact was not in any degree dreaded, for the elements of all the comets were accurately known. That among them we should look for the agency of the threatened fire and destruction had been for many years considered an inadmissible idea. But wonders and wild fancies had been, of late days, strangely rife among mankind, and, although it was only with a few of the ignorant that actual apprehension prevailed, upon the announcement by astronomers of a new comet, yet this announcement was generally received with agitation and mistrust. The elements of the strange orb were immediately calculated, and it was at once conceded by all observers that its path would bring it into very close proximity with the Earth. There were two or three astronomers of secondary note who resolutely maintained that a contact was inevitable. I cannot very well express to you the effect of this intelligence upon the people. For a few short days they would not believe an assertion which their intellect, so long employed among worldly considerations, could not in any manner grasp. But the truth of a vitally important fact soon makes its way into the understanding of even the most stolid. Finally, all men saw that astronomical knowledge lied not, and they awaited the comet. Its approach was not, at first, seemingly rapid, nor was its appearance of very unusual character. It was of a dull red, and had little perceptible train. 
four, seven, or eight days we saw no material increase in its apparent diameter, and but a partial alteration in its color. Meantime the ordinary affairs of men were discarded, and all interests absorbed, in a growing discussion, instituted by the philosophic, in respect to the cometary nature. Even the grossly ignorant, aroused their sluggish capacities to such considerations. The learned now gave their intellect, their soul, to no such points, as the allaying, of fear, or to the sustenance of loved, theory. They sought, they panted for right views. They groaned for perfected knowledge. Truth arose in the purity of her strength, and exceeding majesty, and the wise bowed down and adored. That material injury to our globe, or to its inhabitants would result from the apprehended contact, was an opinion which lost ground among the wise, and the wise were now freely permitted to rule the reason, and the fancy of the crowd. It was demonstrated, that the density of the comet's nucleus was far less than that of our rarest gas, and the harmless passage of a similar visitor among the satellites of Jupiter was a point strongly insisted upon, and which served greatly to allay terror. Theologists, with an earnestness fear enkindled, dwelt upon the biblical prophecies, and expounded them to the people with a directness and simplicity of which no previous instance had been known. That the final destruction of the earth must be brought about by the agency of fire, was urged with a spirit that enforced everywhere conviction, and that the comets were of no fiery nature, as all men now knew, was a truth which relieved all, in a great measure, from the apprehension of the great calamity foretold. It is noticeable that the popular prejudices, and vulgar errors in regard to pestilences and wars, errors which were wont to prevail upon every appearance of a comet were now altogether unknown. As if by some sudden convulsive exertion, reason had at once hurled superstition from her throne. The feeblest intellect had derived vigor from excessive interest. What minor evils might arise from the contact were points of elaborate question. The learned spoke of slight geological disturbances, of probable alterations in climate, and consequently in vegetation, of possible magnetic and electric influences. Many held that no visible or perceptible effect would in any manner be produced. While such discussions were going on, their subject gradually approached, growing larger in apparent diameter, and of a more brilliant luster. Mankind grew paler, as it came. All human operations were suspended. There was an epoch, in the course of the general sentiment, when the comet had attained, at length, a size surpassing that of any previously recorded visitation. The people now, dismissing any lingering hope that the astronomers were wrong, experienced all the certainty of evil. The chimerical aspect of their terror was gone. The hearts of the stoutest of our race beat violently within their bosoms. A very few days sufficed, however, to merge even such feelings and sentiments more unendurable. We could no longer apply to the strange or any accustomed thoughts. Its historical attributes had disappeared. It depressed us with a hideous novelty of emotion. We saw it not as an astronomical phenomenon in the heavens, but as an incubus upon our hearts, and a shadow upon our brains. It had taken, with inconceivable rapidity, the character of a gigantic mantle of rare flame, extending from horizon to horizon. Yet, men breathed with greater freedom. It was clear that we were already within the influence of the comet, yet we lived. We even felt an unusual elasticity of frame and vivacity of mind. The exceeding tenuity of the object of our dread was apparent, for all heavenly objects were plainly visible through it. 
Meantime, our vegetation had perceptibly altered, and we gained faith, from this predicted circumstance, in the foresight of the wise. The wild luxuriance of foliage, utterly unknown before, burst out upon every vegetable thing. Yet another day and the evil was not altogether upon us it was now evident that its nucleus would first reach us a wild change had come over all men, and the first sense of pain was the wild signal for general lamentation and horror. This first sense of pain lay in a rigorous constriction of the breast and lungs, and an insufferable dryness of the skin. It could not be denied that our atmosphere was radically affected, the confirmation of this atmosphere, and the possible modifications to which it might be subjected, were now the topics of discussion. The result of investigation sent an electric thrill of the intensest terror through the universal heart of man. It had been long known that the air which encircled us was a compound of oxygen and nitrogen gases, in the proportion of 21 measures of oxygen, and 79 of nitrogen, in every 100, of the atmosphere. Oxygen, which was the principle of combustion, and the vehicle of heat, was absolutely necessary to the support of animal life, and was the most powerful and energetic agent in nature. Nitrogen, on the contrary, was incapable, of supporting either animal life or flame. An unnatural excess of oxygen would result, it had been ascertained, in just such an elevation of the animal spirits, as we had latterly experienced. It was the pursuit, the extension of the idea, which had engendered all. What would be the result of a total extraction of the nitrogen? A combustion irresistible, all-devouring, omniprevalent, immediate, the entire fulfillment, in all their minute and terrible details, of the fiery and horror, inspiring denunciations of the prophecies of the holy book. Why need I paint the now disenchained frenzy of mankind? That annuity in the comet which had previously inspired us with hope, was now the source of the bitterness of despair. In its impalpable gaseous character we clearly perceived the consummation of fate. Meantime a day again passed, bearing away with it the last shadow of hope. We gasped in the rapid modification of the air. The red blood bounded tumultuously through its strict channels. A few areas, delirium, possessed all men and, with arms rigidly outstretched toward the threatening heavens, they trembled, and shrieked aloud. But the nucleus of the destroyer was now upon us, even here in Eden, I shudder, while I speak. Let me be brief. As the ruin that overwhelmed, for a moment there was a wild lurid light alone, visiting, and penetrating all things. Then let us bow down, before the excessive majesty of the great God then, there came a shouting and pervading sound, as if from the mouth of God, while the whole incumbent mass of ether, in which we existed burst, at once into a species of intense flame, for whose surpassing brilliancy, and all fervid, heat, even the angels in the high heaven, of pure knowledge have no name. Thus ended all. Are there cigarettes here? I sure could use a smoke.